Good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is Steve Jewett. I'm a county court judge in the Ninth uh, Judicial Circuit of Florida in uh, Inafor, Orange County, uh, which is Orlando. Good afternoon. My name is Doreen Hartwell, and I'm an attorney in Las Vegas, Nevada. Good afternoon from Oregon. I am Erin Lagason, and I am the presiding judge of Department 3 of the Oregon Court of Appeals, which is Oregon's Intermediate Appellate Court. Very much looking forward to hearing from you this afternoon. If the team could introduce themselves, please. Hi, I'm Laura Winkler. I'm Karina Mills. Hi, I'm Jacob Daly. Hi, I'm Ellie Rowland, and we represent Highlands High School and the Commonwealth of Kentucky. All right, well, we're here today. Uh, this is unit five, and we're going to be answering or dealing with uh, question two. It reads as follows, quote, a bill of rights is what the people are entitled to against every government on earth, general or particular, and that and what no just government should refuse or rest on inference, end quote. Do you agree or disagree with Thomas Jefferson's statement? Additional questions, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a national bill of rights as compared to the state bills of rights? And what are the differences between positive and negative rights and which are more important to the preservation of liberty? You may proceed. As John, as John, Locke, as John Locke advocated in his second treatise on civil government, the government has no power other than protecting individual rights. Jefferson furthered this in his letter to Madison where he stresses that these rights are too important to rest on inference. We agree with Jefferson's statement that the Bill of Rights is necessary. Old Wake 4 showcases that citizens must yield part of their natural liberty, that the government must ensure most rights are maintained. Anti-Federalists, including Jefferson, were worried that without a Bill of Rights, the government would fail in this maintenance. Old Wig 4 showcases that citizens must yield part of their natural liberty, but the government must ensure that most rights are maintained. Anti-Federalists, including Jefferson, were worried that without a Bill of Rights, the government would fail in this maintenance. However, Hamilton argued in Federalist 84, the body of the Constitution protects natural rights, as seen in Article 3, Section 2, which protects the right to trial by jury, and Article 6, which prohibits religious qualifications for holding public office. He also argued that in conjunction with the federal con Constitution, state Bill of Rights are sufficient. Nonetheless, this panel agrees with Robert Yates and Brutus too that the grand security of the people in particular rights, such as the, Bill of, the rights of the accused, were not represented in the body of the Constitution. Anti-Federalists worried the federal government would overrule state Bill of Rights, thus a federal Bill of Rights was necessary in limiting central power. In, in an address to the New York and Virginian Convention in 1788 and the Impartial Examiner I, Anti-Federalists argued that certain constitutional clauses, such as the General Welfare Clause, or the Supremacy Clause would allow Congress to infringe on individuals' rights, rights unless they were secured. However, Federalist Edmund Pendleton wrote to Richard Henry Lee that it is safer not to include a Bill of Rights as it does not list every unalienable, unalienable right. To refute this, the framers introduced the Ninth Amendment to affirm the existence of enumerated rights. An example of this is Griswold v. Connecticut as the right to premarital privacy is not in the Constitution but, prote but protected under the Ninth Amendment. Negative rights are most important as they are the basis of democratic self-rule, ensuring autonomy while prohibiting the government from interfering with our fundamental rights. The Bill of Rights is largely made up of negative rights, as seen in the First Amendment's assertion that Congress shall make no law that violates individuals' protection of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. For example, the case of Near v. Minnesota upheld the negative rights under the First Amendment by ruling it unconstitutional for the U.S. government to censor press. On the other hand, positive rights require the government to provide certain services to create equality, such as public health care or police protection. Positive rights require government support and are therefore harder to justify in the Constitution. Yet the Sixth and Seventh Amendments do contain positive rights that require the government to establish and fund court systems with judges and juries. The addition of state bill of rights provided the capability of granting more protection per the 10th Amendment of Rights because the states are able to delegate funds and services to uphold positive rights that aren't explicitly included in the National Bill of Rights. Um, I apologize, my other sheet got messed up, so I'm going to have to read it off our computer real quick or I guess Karina or Laura, if you want to continue with your part. 
Uh, this can be seen through Article 27 of the Massachusetts State Constitution, which was amended to include environmental rights provisions to tailor to their population. Another Im immense advantage of the State Bill of Rights is that the amendment process of the state constitution is easier than that of the federal constitution. For example, in Kentucky, if the supermajority of either house of the Kentucky General Assembly approves a proposed amendment, it is voted on during the next general election by citizens. Conversely, Article 5 of the federal constitution outlines a lengthy amendment process that prohibits the U.S. Bill of Rights to adapt with changes in society. The right to privacy is never explicitly stated in the U.S. Bill of Rights. However, pr provisions in state constitutions have been adopted to guarantee the right to privacy. Article 1, Section 6 of the Illinois State Bill of Rights states that the people shall have the right to be secure from invasions of privacy. May we finish our opening statement? We agree that the U.S. Bill of Rights was critical in establishing a baseline of fundamental rights and that states' Bill of Rights are necessary to protect from oppressive federal action. As written in Old World 4, we ought carefully to guard ourselves by a Bill of Rights against the invasion of those liberties which it is essential for us to retain. Thank you, and we're not ready for your questions. Okay, so um, what limits, if any, should be placed on the rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights? And have there, have there have limits been placed there? Limits should be placed on certain amendments in the Bill of Rights if, in order to protect the general welfare. We see examples of this in religious limits, such as U.S. v. Reynolds, which declared that polygamy was illegal, as even it was a limit on freedom of religion, but it was in order to protect the general welfare. And another example, another example is seen through the Patriot Act in which the government limited um, Fourth Amendment rights to search and seizure in order to detect and prevent terrorism in the United States. Furthermore, a, a limit on freedom of speech can be seen through the events that occurred on January 6, where an individual has the right to speak um, freely and their mind, but they do not have the ability or um, the right to um, protest in a way that is harmful to the public or to public officers. And as my colleague Laura said earlier with the Patriot Act, it's a kind of a very big thing on the inferred right of privacy. And that gives like the government kind of the overarching kind of a like a card to be able to collect that information for the national security interests of the United States of America. Okay, Doreen. You're muted. Sorry. I'm rubbing um, what, off on you. <laughs> what is the difference, if any, between rights added through the amendment process and those established by a court decision? Amendments added or rights added through the amendment process are often more harder to obtain because amendments are so difficult um, to achieve and um, court orders um, create rights more often because um, the court then establishes new rights as the society is continuing. We also see that it is easier to get Supreme Court decisions overruled than getting rid of a right in the Bill of Rights or an amendment, such as the um, pushes to overturn Roe v. Wade in, plant, in the right to an abortion. And we also see this not just federally with the National Bill of Rights, but also in all 50 states, they had their own Bill of Rights and rights and kind of whatever, you know, laws or amendments that they want to add. And that's another very um, you know, successful way and a lot quicker and more efficient than a national standard of doing it. Furthermore, this can be seen in the Supreme Court decision of Bowers v. Hardwick, which establishes sexual privacy and orientation. But in certain states, this right um, is being attempted to be over uh, attempted to be infringed upon. So this is an, an issue in which the Supreme Court has ruled on a decision, but um, certain states are taking steps to um, evoke that right. I think your responses lead into my question. Um, the Supreme Court has identified a number of individual rights through the doctrine of substantive due process. What, what are some of those, those rights? And in your, your view, are they positive rights or negative rights? The 14th Amendment includes the doctrine of incorporation in which um, 
the states are required to fully incorporate specific rights. And so in regards to substantive due process rights, I believe the case of Gitlow v. New York ruled that um, the First Amendment must be, the First Amendment freedom of speech must be applied to all states. Furthermore, concerning um, doctrine of incorporation, um, we can see that there is, again, um, that conf those conflicting rulings in Barron v. Baltimore, which ruled that the Federal Bill of Rights um, does not fully, is not fully incorporated into all um, states and that the Bill of Rights only protects from federal oppress oppressive action. Okay, you, know, you guys in your prepared statement mentioned um, that the the state constitutions are, are, for lack of a term, more nimble. It's easier to uh, to amend them. Um, which is better? Uh, would it be? Is it better that that they can be amended on a, a, a supermajority vote, or should these documents be because they're so important? Should they be more difficult um, to uh, to react? I believe that it is better that state amendments are um, more easily amendable because then they can um, change with society. Um, we can see that a lot of the outdated language used in the Constitution no longer applies to today because of the changes in society the founders could not and the drafters of the Constitution could not have ever envisioned what society today would have looked like. An example of this is the right to bear arms. Um, this is something that I personally, personally believe should be revised because um, it has led to um, incredibly um, disastrous consequences that the founders could not have ever um, have ever predicted. But today, that is an example of a change where change is necessary, but it cannot be um, brought because of the lengthy federal amendment process. I agree. Go ahead, Jake. I agree with what Karina said. It makes it a lot more of, although it's a little, it's a lot more nimble it kind of makes it very more effective and kind of strengthens that tightness of being able to, as she said, adapt with new challenges every day. A very big factor we kind of see within this is technology and kind of what's the rights between that. And also one of my favorite things to go to is, you know, there's a lot of inferred rights and especially with the right to privacy, where does that fall with technology of these, you know, things that we have now, such as social media or technology or phones and such aren't mentioned at all in the Bill of Rights or Constitutions. So how do you, you know, manage that or make a standard for that in the 21st century? We also see that some state constitutions have certain aspects of them, like the New Mexico State Constitution includes lengthy educational provisions and discusses that students, schools are required to teach in both the English and Spanish language. And I feel like with instances like that, that it is, necessary that they're easier to amend to reflect the differing needs from their citizens than citizens in other states. It is also important to note that federal law and the Bill of Rights trumps state constitutions, even though state constitutions are more easily amendable. For example, Alabama still includes segregation language in regards to their schooling. However, the case of Brown v. Board of Education overturns that because it is a federal case. Okay. Great, thank you. Somebody wanna go? I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Good job guys, well done. And Jacob, don't um, stress out about the technical difficulties. <laughs> We're not gonna ding you for it. Um, I, I just thought um, you guys totally answered the question. Your prepared remarks I thought were well done. You covered everything. You you explained it. You took away some of. You explained things so well that you you eliminated a couple of my questions because you already covered it. Um, I thought that you all had great participation. Um, we didn't get a chance to ask many follow up questions because all of you had something to say, and everything that you added was substantive and responsive. And so I thought that was a great job. Um, well done with that. Um, and your just your your reasoning. You it was a very um, good application of not just the, the statutes, the amendments, but the, the reasoning and the, the logic behind, um, behind the, the rulings. I thought it, it demonstrated a very good understanding by each of you of all of the, the um, constitutional um, principles 
at issue in this question. Uh, I just, I, I thought, well done, just well done. Good job. I, I agree. Your uh, prepared remarks addressed everything. Um, I can tell that you worked a really, you know, it, I mean, you, you've definitely put a lot of work in, into this and have, learning the background information and, and the cases. I uh, appreciate in particular your discussions of the roles of state constitutions. It, it's part of, the, part of the questions and, and you've gone out and explored um, not only your own constitution, but you know, looked at, at the other, other constitutions and, and you displayed a relationship, a, a knowledge of the relationship between the state constitutions and, and the federal constitution, at least insofar as if the state constitutions are less protective of rights, you explained how uh, with you know, Brown v. Board of Ed, um, any uh, segregation wording in the Alabama constitution has been displaced and um, I think it's just remarkable to have that that understanding of the state federal dynamics at, at, at your ages. And so, um, thanks. Yeah, I, I'll uh, I just echo everything they said. I don't really have anything more to add. I thought the opening uh, prepared statement was was good. It, re it really hit all the points. Uh, I did want to follow up with what Aaron just said. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask a follow up question to say, well, what happens if the the you know. Uh, the state gives more expansive rights and to see where you would go with that i expect that you would answer to say that the state's rights of course their constitution then uh controls um that's the way it is in the state of florida we do have a right to privacy that's specifically um outlined in our in our constitution that was that did come from the people though um and i asked you that question i think that um you guys kind of you got it right uh, but there but there is a downside and something you want to think about when you answer the question if it comes again about the uh, referendum changes to a state constitution. It does make it more nimble. It does make it more reactive and things can change quicker. Um, but there's a downside to that, that it may not necessarily, that's something that's a, a political uh, hot potato at, the, at that point in time. And they can uh, you know, marshal the votes to get that in their constitution. And then, uh, then, it's, then you get, you're stuck with it. So it's something to think about that that, that nimbleness also leads to a danger. Uh, that that uh, to a, to some some you know amendments that may not uh, really be good in the long run, um, but no, I think you did a great job. Again, that to me, and this is the more interesting thing, is the interplay between the federal simple you know between the, the states and the and the, uh, the federal constitution and stuff. And I'll tell you, that's pretty much what my questions are always about. So, uh, I really good job. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, good luck, guys. Thank you.